This uh, morning's lecture is called Pan-Relationalism. One of the salient facts about contemporary Western philosophy is that non-Anglophones don't read much Anglophone philosophy, and conversely, the gap between so-called analytic and what Americans call continental philosophy shows no signs of being bridged. This seems a pity because the most interesting work being done in these two traditions overlaps to an important extent. Closing this gap might produce an epical change and that analytic philosophers might cease to work under the shadow of Kant, at least the Kant that I read as opposed to the ones that Brandom and McDowell read, that, or Kant as read by me as opposed to the Kant as read by them. And non-analytic philosophers might cease to think that if you abandon Kant's terminology, you thereby endanger, for better or worse, the Enlightenment's political project. At present, conversation between the two philosophical traditions are, is typified by dialogues between Kantians, like the one between Rawls and Habermas, recently published in the Journal of Philosophy, Dialogues between analytic anti-Kantians like Annette Beyer and Donald Davidson and continental anti-Kantians like Lyotard and Derrida are not taking place. Ceasing to ask modal Kantian questions like necessary or contingent, <coughs> transcendentally or only empirically real, unconditional or merely conditional, would liberate analytic philosophy from its temptation to take the realist, anti-realist debate seriously. It might thus put an end to the constant attempts to remain an empirical realist by dreaming up still fancier linguistified versions of transcendental idealism. Ceasing to think that asking such modal questions are, are, is our only safeguard against anti-enlightenment irrationalism might liberate Habermas from his conviction that Kant remains the official philosopher of bourgeois liberalism. Doing so would enable him to realize that now that we bourgeois liberals have Dewey, we no longer need Kant. In this lecture, I'll try to sketch a way of looking at things which is common to the philosophers I most admire on both sides of the gap. One way to describe this commonality is to say that philosophers as diverse as Davidson and Derrida, Putnam and Latour, Brandom and Foucault are in the main, and despite occasional backsliding, pan-relationalists. Thinking of things as being what they are in virtue of their relations to other things and the tradition of Leibniz's monads mirroring the universe and Whitehead's actual entities as nexus of prehensions is there a way of shaking off the influence of the metaphysical dualisms which we inherited from the Greeks? The distinctions between essence and accident, substance and property, and appearance and reality. They're trying to replace the various world pictures constructed with the aid of these Greek oppositions by the picture of a flux of continually changing relations, relations whose terms are this, themselves dissoluble into nexus of further relations. Uh, here I'm inserting a footnote from page 13. It's useful to think of Whitehead's criticism of Aristotle, a criticism found in other early 20th century philosophers, for example, Peirce and Russell, who tried to formulate a non-subject predicate relational logic as paralleling Derrida's criticism of logocentrism. Derrida's picture of words as nodes in an infinitely flexible web of relationships to other words is obviously reminiscent of Whitehead's account in Process and Reality of actual occasions as constituted by relations to all other actual occasions. My hunch is that the 20th century will be seen by historians of philosophy as the period in which a kind of neo-Leibnizian pan-relationalism was developed in various different idioms, a pan-relationalism which restates Leibniz's idea that each monad is nothing but all the other monads seen from a certain perspective, each substance nothing but its relations to all the other substances. Back to page two. One obvious consequence of their pan-relationalism is that they do not make a dis these philosophers do not make a distinction between intrinsic non-relational and extrinsic relational properties. Another is that they have no use for modal distinctions and in particular for the sort of distinctions between necessary and contingent properties which essentialists like Aristotle and Saul Kripke used to draw the line between essence and accident and which Kantians used to draw the line between conditions of possibility and conditions of actuality. 
by dropping Leibniz's distinction between the physical and the metaphysical and Whitehead's distinction between conceptual and physical prehensions, they produce a pan-relationalism in which no relations are more essential to anything than any other except under some particular description of that thing. One obvious advantage of pan-relationalism is that it lets one put aside the distinction between subject and object, between the elements in human knowledge contributed by the mind and those contributed by the world. It does so by saying that nothing is what it is under any and every description of it, what it is as undescribed, apart from, sorry, the sentence doesn't make sense. It does so by saying that nothing is what it is under any and every description of it. We can't make sense of the notion of what it is as undescribed apart from its relations to the human needs and interests which have generated one or another description. This is the move which leads to charges of idealism or linguisticism or losing touch with the world being brought against the pan-relationalists. They reply to this charge, as I'll be saying later in more detail, by urging that once we cease to describe knowing about something as representing its intrinsic nature accurately and thereby break representational links to the world, we still have causal links. Anybody who grants that the world has the causal power to change our descriptions of it, they claim, should be immune to accusations of subjectivism and relativism. Most of the philosophers I've identified as pan-relationalists could, I hope, be persuaded to accept the following argument. A property is simply a hypothesized predicate, so there are no properties which are incapable of being captured in language. Predication is a way of relating things to other things, a way of hooking up bits of the universe with other bits of the universe, or, if you like, as a way of spotlighting certain webs of relationships rather than other webs. All properties, therefore, are hypostatizations of webs of relationships. Whether you think of these relationships realistically as somehow there before the inventions of the predicates, or whether you think of them anti-realistically as coming into existence along with such inventions, is a matter of complete indifference. This contradicts something I said two days ago, but it's not the only contradiction in, the, in these lectures. <laughs> that is a paradigm of the kind of question which pragmatists dismiss as making no difference to practice and therefore making no difference to cool. My hunch is that the question which arises between realists and anti-realists is one which originates in philosophy's impossible attempt to combine an Aristotelian substance accident metaphysics with a corpuscularian law event physics. Once the latter sort of physics began to take hold, it made it possible to see such properties as goodness and redness as relational, and attempted one to see every description of anything as owing as much to the purposes of the describer as redness owes to the eye of the beholder. But the pull of Aristotelian essentialism tempts us in the opposite direction. It tempts one to follow Descartes in dividing the universe into race cogitans and race extensa, and thus to conceive of two substances, the subject and the object, struggling for domination over a third. The third is variously identified as experience, thought, language, or culture. When it's identified as culture, we find philosophers dividing culture down the middle into the parts, art, literature, and politics, for example, where the subject gets the upper hand, and the parts, for example, sense perception of primary qualities, as when John Searle bangs his hand down on his desk, medicine, the natural sciences, the side where the, the object wins out. After such a division is made, people start taking sides with, for example, Heidegger and Gadamer giving the palm to the literary culture and Carnap and Searle giving it to the scientific culture. At a final stage, we find cultural politics being mixed up with real politics, as when we are told that respect for natural science will prevent fascist takeovers, or alternatively, that respect for natural science will encourage the aggressive use of biopower by technocrats. Starting out by being adjudicators of culture wars, philosophers quickly take sides and become participants. I see pan-relationalism as a way of putting a stop to the attempt to divide culture up in this way by abandoning the picture of subject and object striving for control. To be a pan-relationalist means never using the terms objective or subjective except in the context of some well-defined expert culture in which we can distinguish between adherence to the procedures which lead the experts to agree and refusal so to adhere.
It also means never asking whether a description is better suited to an object than another description without being able to answer the question, what purpose is this description supposed to serve? That question is never to be answered to get the object right or to represent the object accurately. Pan-relationalists are pragmatists because they don't take such purposes seriously. They can't do so because explicating what's meant by getting something right or representing it accurately requires making some of the object's properties essential and some accidental. If you're a pan-relationalist, you're automatically a pragmatist. So much for a large, vague sketch of what I mean by pan-relationalism. Now I want to offer a suggestion about how to see things from the pan-relationalist point of view. This is that you think of everything as if it were a number. The nice thing about numbers for my present purpose is just that it's very difficult to think of them as having intrinsic natures. It's hard to think of a number as having an essential core surrounded by a penumbra of accidental relationships. Numbers are an admirable example of something difficult to describe in essentialist, substantialist language. To see my point, ask yourself what the essence of the number 17 is, what it is in itself apart from its relationships to other numbers. What's wanted is a description of 17 which is different in kind from the following descriptions, less than 22, more than 8, the sum of 6 and 11, the square root of 289, the square of 4.123105, the difference between 1678922 and 1678905, and so on. The tiresome thing about all these descriptions is that none of them seems to get closer to the number 17 than do any of the others. Equally tiresomely, there are obviously an infinite number of other descriptions which you could offer of 17, all of which would be equally accidental and extrinsic. None of these descriptions seems to give you a clue to the intrinsic 17-ness of 17, the unique feature which makes it the very number that it is. For which of these descriptions you apply is obviously a matter of what purpose you have in mind, the particular situation that caused you to think of the number 17 in the first place. If we want to be essentialist about the number 17, we have to say, in philosophical jargon, that all its infinitely many relations to infinitely many other numbers are internal relations. That is, none of these relations could be different without the number 17 being different. So there seems to, no, seems to be no way to define the essence of 17-hood short of finding some mechanism for generating all the true descriptions of 17, specifying its relation to all the other numbers. Mathematicians can, in fact, produce such a mechanism by axiomatizing arithmetic or by reducing numbers to sets and axiomatizing set theory. But if the mathematician then points to his neat little batch of axioms and says, behold, the essence of 17, we feel cheated because there's nothing very 17-ish about these axioms. They are equally the essence of 1, 2, 289, and so on. At this point, I hope you'll conclude that whatever sorts of things may have intrinsic natures, numbers don't, that it doesn't pay to be an essentialist about numbers. Pan-relationalism relationalism holds that it also doesn't pay to be essentialist about tables, stars, electrons, human beings, academic disciplines, social institutions, or anything else. We suggest that you think of all such objects as resembling numbers in the following respect. There's nothing to be known about them except an infinitely large, forever expansible web of relationships to other objects. There's no point in asking for terms of relations which are not themselves relations, for everything that can serve as the term of a relation can be dissolved into another set of relations, and so on forever. There are, so to speak, relations all the way down and all the way out in every direction. You never reach something which is not just one more nexus of relations. The system of natural numbers is a good model of the universe because in that system it's obvious and obviously harmless that there are no terms of relations which are not simply clusters of further relation. To say that relations go all the way down is a corollary of what Sellers called psychological nominalism, that is, of the doctrine that there's nothing to be known about anything save what's stated in sentences describing it. For every sentence about an object is an explicit or implicit description of the relation of that thing to one or more other objects. So if there's no knowledge by acquaintance, no knowledge which doesn't take the form of a sentential attitude, then there's nothing to be known about anything save its relation to other things. 
who insists that there's a difference between a non-relational ordo ascendi and a relational ordo cognoscendi, is inevitably to recreate the Kantian thing in itself. To make that move is to substitute a nostalgia for immediacy, to substitute the hope of salvation by a non-human power for the utopian hope, hopes for a self-made human future. It's to reinvent what Heidegger called the ontotheological tradition, a tradition which binds Aristotle to Kant and which cannot survive without modal distinctions. For psychological nominalists, no description of an object is more a description of the real as opposed to the apparent object than any other, nor are any of them descriptions of, so to speak, the object's relation to itself, of its identity with its essence. Some of them are, to be sure, better descriptions than others, but this betterness is a matter of being more useful tools, tools which accomplish some human purpose better than do competing descriptions. All these purposes are, from a philosophical as opposed to a practical point of view, on a par. There's no overriding purpose called, for example, discovering the truth, which takes precedence. As I was saying yesterday, pragmatists don't think the truth is an aim of inquiry. The aim of inquiry is utility, and there are as many different useful tools as there are purposes to be served. In order to show in more detail how things look from a pan-relationalist perspective, I return to my claim that numbers are a good model for objects in general. Common sense, or at least Western common sense, has trouble with this claim because it seems counterintuitive to say that physical spatiotemporal objects dissolve into webs of relationship, into webs of relations in the way that numbers do. If philosophy dissolves numbers away into relations to other numbers, nobody is going to mourn the loss of their substantial, independent, autonomous reality, except maybe Pythagoreans. Um, but things are different with tables and stars and electrons. Here, common sense is inclined to stick in its toes and say you can't have relations without something to be related. If there weren't a hard, substantial, autonomous table to stand in relation to, for example, you and me in the chair, or to be constituted out of hard, substantial, elementary particles, there would be nothing to get related, and so no relations. The pan-relationalist -re pan reply to this bit of common sense is pretty much the reply which Barclay made to Locke's attempt to distinguish primary from secondary qualities, the reply which Peir cited as the first invocation of the pragmatic principle that every difference must make a difference to practice. The contemporary linguistified form of Barclay's reply is, all that we know about this hard substantial table, about the thing that gets related as opposed to its relations, is that certain sentences are true of it. For example, the following sentences. It is rectangular, it is brown, it is ugly, it is made out of a tree, it is smaller than a house, it is larger than a mouse, it is less luminous than a star, and so on and so on. There's nothing to be known about an object except what sentences are true of it. The pan-relationalist argument thus comes down to saying that since all sentences can do is to relate objects to one another, every sentence which describes an object will implicitly or explicitly attribute a relational property to it. I have a footnote about non-relational properties, but I'll skip that. So we should substitute a picture of language as a way of hooking objects up to one another for the picture of language as a veil interposed between us and the objects. That also means, of course, thinking of language as, you know, something without which we wouldn't know what an object was. Essentialists typically rejoin at this point that psychological nominalism must be a mistake and that we have to retrieve what was true in empiricism and not admit that language provides our only cognitive access to objects. McDowell is distinctive because his way of Retrieving what was true in empiricism admits that language provides our only cognitive access to objects. It makes his position unique. <laughs> These essentialists suggest that we must have some prelinguistic knowledge of objects, knowledge that cannot be caught in language. This knowledge, they say, is what prevents the table or the number or the human being from what they sneeringly call a mere linguistic construct. To illustrate what he means by non-linguistic knowledge, the essentialist at this point in the argument bangs his hand on the table and flinches. 
He thereby hopes to demonstrate that he has acquired a bit of knowledge and a kind of intimacy with the table which escapes the reach of language. He claims that the, no the knowledge of the table's intrinsic causal powers, its sheer brute thereness, keeps him in touch with reality in a way the anti-essentialist is not. Unfazed by this suggestion that he is out of touch, the anti-essentialist reiterates that if you want to know what the table really intrinsically is, the best answer you are going to get is that of which the following statements are true. It is brown, ugly, painful to banging hands, capable of being stumbled over, made of atoms, and so on and so on. The painfulness, the solidity, and the causal powers of the table are on all fours with its brownness and its ugliness. Just as you do not get on more intimate terms with the number 17 by discovering its square root, you do not get on more intimate terms with the table closer to its intrinsic nature by hitting it than by talking about it. All that hitting it or decomposing it into atoms does is to enable you to relate it to a few more things. It doesn't take you out of language into fact, or out of appearance into reality, or out of a remote and disinterested relationship into a more immediate and intense relationship. The point of this little exchange is, once again, that the pan-relationalist denies that there is a way to pick out an object from the rest of the universe except as the object of which a certain set of sentences is true. Without Wittgen with Wittgenstein, the pan-relationalist says that ostension only works against the backdrop of a linguistic practice and that the self-identity of the thing picked out is its self-description relative. Pan-relationalists think that the distinction between things related and relations is just an alternative way of making the distinction between what we're talking about and what we say about it. The latter distinction is, as Whitehead said, just an hypostatization of the relation between linguistic subject and linguistic predicate. Just as the utterance of a noun conveys no information to people who are unfamiliar with adjectives and verbs, so there is no way to convey information except by relating something to something else. Only in the context of a sentence, we are told on good authority, does a word have meaning. But that means that there is no way of getting behind language to some more immediate, non-linguistic form of acquaintance with what we're talking about. Only when linked up with some other parts of speech does a noun have a use, and only as a term of a relation can an object be an object of knowledge. Our sense that we can know a thing without knowing its relations to other things is explained away by pan-relationalist philosophers as a reflection of the difference between being certain about some familiar, taken-for-granted, obvious relations in which the thing stands and being uncertain about its other relations. 17, for example, starts out by being the sum of 17 ones, the number between 16 and 18, and so on, Enough such familiar statements, and we begin to think of 17 as a thing waiting to get related to other things. When we're told that 17 is also the difference between 1,678,922 1, and 1,678,905, 1, we feel that we've learned about a rather remote, inessential connection between it and something else, rather than more about 17 itself. But when pressed, we have to admit that the latter relation is no more or less intrinsic than that between 16 and 17. For in the case of numbers, there's no clear sense to be given to the term intrinsic. We don't really want to say that 17, in the secret depths of its heart, feels closer to 16 than the numbers that further down the line. Pan-relationalists suggest that we also brush aside the question of whether the hardness of the table is more intrinsic to the table than its color, or whether the atomic constitution of the star Polaris is more intrinsic to it than its location in a given constellation. The question of whether there really are such things as constellations, or whether they are merely illusions produced by the fact that we cannot visually distinguish the distance of stars, strikes anti-essentialists as as bad as the question of whether there really are such things as moral values or whether they are merely projections of human wishes. They suggest we brush aside all questions about where the thing stops and its relations begin, all questions about where its intrinsic nature star starts and its external relations begin, all questions about where its essential core ends and its accidental periphery begins. Pan-relationalists like to ask, with Wittgenstein, whether a chessboard is really one thing or 64 things, 
or with James whether the Star of David is really one triangle superimposed on another triangle, or rather a hexagon surrounded by six triangles. To ask that question, they think, is to expose its foolishness, its lack of any interesting point. Questions which have a point are those which meet William James's requirement that any difference must make a difference. Other questions, such as those about the ontological status of constellations or moral values, are merely verbal, or worse yet, merely philosophical. The residual essentialism of common sense may rejoin to all this that panrelationalism is, once again, a sort of linguistic idealism, a way of suggesting that there was really nothing there to be talked about before people began talking, that objects are artifacts of language. But this rejoinder is a confusion between the question, how do we pick out objects, and do objects antedate being picked out by us? The anti-essentialist has no doubt that there were trees and stars long before there were statements about trees and stars, because it's built into the language game we play with the words tree and star that there were. If you don't think there were, you don't understand the word very well. But the fact of antecedent existence is of no use in giving sense to the question, what are trees and stars apart from their relations to other things, apart from our statements about them? Nor is it of any help in giving sense to the skeptic's claim that trees and stars have non-relational intrinsic essences which may, alas, be beyond our ken. If that claim is to have a clear meaning, we have to be able to say something more about what is beyond our ken, what we're being deprived of, otherwise we're stuck with Kant's unknowable thing in itself. From the pan-relationalist point of view, the Kantian lament that we are forever trapped behind the veil of subjectivity is merely the pointless because tautologists claim that something we defined as being beyond our knowledge is, alas, beyond our knowledge. The essentialist picture of the relation between language and world drives him back on the claim that the world is identifiable independently of language. That's why he has to insist that the world is initially known to us through a kind of non-linguistic encounter, through banging into it or letting it bounce some photons off our retinas, letting them penetrate our retinas. This initial encounter is an encounter with the very world itself, the world as it intrinsically is. When we try to recapture what we learned in this encounter in language, however, we are frustrated by the fact that the sentences of our language merely relate things to other things. The sentences, this is brown, or this is square, or this is hard, tell us something about how our nervous system deals with emanations from the neighborhood of the object. Sentences like, it is located at the following space-time coordinates, are even more obviously sentences which tell us about what the essentialist mournfully calls merely relational merely accidental properties. Confronted with this impasse, the essentialist is tempted to turn for help to natural science. He is tempted to say that a sentence like, it is made up of the following sorts of elementary particles arranged in the following ways, gets us inside the object as it truly is. Um, parenthetically, I confess that I had thought this kind of intuitive physicalism was out of fashion but when, in the 1970s, Kripke published his Naming and Necessity, uh, everybody suddenly began agreeing with Kripke that, yes, it's the elementary particles which are what's really essential to the thing. Uh, it, was, you know, it was as if physicalism had been lurking in the shadows all the time and just needed, a, you know, just needed an opening to come back into fashion. This last line of defense for essentialist philosophers is the belief that physical science gets us outside ourselves, outside our language and our needs, and our purpose to something splendidly non-human and non-relational. Essentialists who re retreat to this line argue that 17th century corpuscularians like Hobbes and Boyle were right to distinguish between the features of things which are really in them and those which it is useful for human purposes to describe them as having. To us anti-essentialists, descriptions of objects in terms of elementary particles are useful in many different ways, as many ways as particle physics can contribute either to technological advances or imaginative astrophysical redescriptions of the universe as a whole, but that sort of utility is their only virtue. 
to the, essential, to the essentialist philosophers and to many natural scientists who do not otherwise concern themselves with philosophy, this pragmatic view of physics of as the handmaiden of technology and of the poetic imagination is offensive. These people share a sense that particle physics, and more generally whatever scientific vocabulary could in principle serve to formulate an explanation of any phenomenon whatever, is an example of a kind of truth which pragmatism doesn't recognize. This kind of truth is not a matter of the utility of a description for a human purpose, but rather of a transcendence of the merely human. Particle physics has, so to speak, become the last refuge of the Greek sense of wonder, the sense of an encounter with the almost holy other. Why does particle physics seem to give the notion of intrinsic nature a new lease on life? I think the answer is that the vocabulary of this branch of physics seems to offer a special kind of mastery and self-assurance, in that it can, in principle, explain the utility of all other descriptions as well as its own. An ideal psychophysics would treat human beings as themselves swirls of particles and would provide explanations of why these organisms had developed certain linguistic habits, why they have described the world as they have. So it seems as if such an ideal physics could treat utility to human beings as itself something explicable, subsumable, capable of being distanced and put in perspective. When we think of the universe in terms of the dispersion and interaction of particles, we seem to rise above human needs and look down on them. We seem to become slightly more than human, for we seem to have distanced ourselves from our own humanity and seen ourselves within a non-human perspective, within the largest possible context. For us anti-essentialists, this temptation to think that we have eluded our human finitude by seeing ourselves under the aspect of elementary particles is just one more attempt to create a divinity, a god of power, and then to claim a share in the divine life. The trouble with all such attempts is that the need to be God is just one more human need. Or to put the point less invidiously, the project of seeing all our needs from the point of view of someone without any such needs is just one more human project. Stoic absence of passion, Zen absence of will, Heideggerian Gelassenheit, and physics as the absolute conception of reality are from this angle just so many variations on a single project the project of escaping from time and chance. We pan-relationalists, however, cannot afford to sneer at this project. For in our strictly philosophical capacity, as opposed to our political capacity, we can't afford to sneer at any human project, any chosen form of human life, any description which aids somebody to live. In particular, we should not allow ourselves to say what I've just said, that by taking this view of physical science, we seem to see ourselves as more than human. For a pan-relationalist cannot invoke the appearance-reality distinction. We can't say that our opponent's way of looking at physics gets physics wrong, mistakes its intrinsic nature, substitutes an accidental and inessential use of it for what it is in itself. On our view, physical science no more has an intrinsic nature than does the number 17. Like 17, it's capable of being described in an infinity of ways, and none of these ways is the inside way. Seeing ourselves as participating in the divine life by describing ourselves under the aspect of eternity or under the aspect of ele elementary particles is not an illusion or a confusion, it's just one more attempt to satisfy one more human need. Seeing ourselves as at last in touch through physical science with the ultimate nature of reality is also not an illusion or a confusion. It is one more human project which may, like all human projects, eclipse the possibility of other more or less incompatible projects. Nor can we pan-relationalists our, let ourselves get away with saying that our essentialist opponents mistakenly think that they have eluded human finitude by taking refuge in a secularized version of a theology of power. It's not as if human finitude were the ultimate truth of the matter, as if human beings were intrinsically finite. On our view, human beings are what they make themselves, 
And one of the things they wanted to make themselves is a divinity, what Sattva calls a being in and for itself. We pan-relationalists cannot say with Sattva that this attempt is a futile passion. The metaphysical systems of Aristotle and Spinoza, or Kant's fanatical pursuit of the unconditional, are not exercises in futility any more than the anti-metaphysical systems of James, Nietzsche, and Sattva himself. There is no inescapable truth which either metaphysicians or pragmatists are trying to evade or capture, for any candidate for truth can be, es can be escaped by a suitable choice of description and can be underwritten by another such choice. What about the Safian proposition that human beings are what they make themselves, which I've just put forward as pan-relationalist doctrine? Is that proposition true? Well, it's true in the same way that Piano's axioms for arithmetic are true. These axioms sum up the implication of the use of a certain vocabulary, the vocabulary of numbers. But suppose you have no interest in using that vocabulary. You hate numbers. Suppose, for example, that you're willing to forgo the advantages of counting and calculating because of a morbid fear of technology. You're willing and eager to speak a language in which no mention of the number 17 occurs. For you, Piano's axioms are not candidates for truth. They have no relevance to your projects. So it is for the Sartrean proposition. This proposition sums up a certain view about what sorts of projects it is best to pursue. If, however, your own projects are religious or metaphysical, if you deeply need to feel safe within the everlasting arms of a god of power, and are therefore willing to forego the advantages of the kind of egalitarian politics and romantic art whose implications Sattva sums up, then Sattva's proposition will not even strike you as a plausible truth candidate. You may call it false if you like, but the falsity is not like the falsity of a candidate for truth which has been tested and found wanting. It's rather a matter of obvious irrelevance, obvious inability to be of any use for your purposes. Putting a Sartrean description before a Spinozist is like putting a bicycle pump in the hands of a ditch digger or a yardstick in the hands of a brain surgeon. It's not even a candidate for utility. Is there then no argument possible between Sartre and Spinoza, no communication between Peano and the anti-technologist? It makes all the difference here whether we're talking about argument or about communication. You can have communication and disagreement without an argument being joined, having been joined. Indeed, you often do. That's what happens whenever we find ourselves unable to find common premises, when we have to agree to differ, when we start talking about differences of taste. Communication requires no more than agreement to use the same tools to pursue shared needs. Argument requires agreement about which needs take priority over others. The language and the common sense which the Spinozist and the Sartreans share reflects the fact that both need food, sex, shelter, books, and quite a lot of other things, and that they go about getting these things in much the same ways. Their inability to argue fruitfully on philosophical questions reflects the fact that neither gives much weight to the particular needs which led the other to philosophize. Similarly, the inability of two painters to agree on how to paint reflects the fact that neither gives much weight to the needs which led the other to the easel. To say that such disagreements are merely philosophical or merely artistic is to say that when they agree to put philosophy or painting aside, the participants can agree to collaborate on common projects. To say their, to say their philosophical or artistic disagreements are nevertheless profound and important is to say that neither considers these other projects central to their lives. This way of putting things may seem to neglect the fact that Sartrean sometimes turns Spinozist, atheist, Catholic, anti-essentialist, essentialist, metaphysicians, pragmatist, and vice versa. More generally, it seems to neglect the fact that people change their central projects change those parts of their self-image they, which they had previously found most precious. The question is, however, whether this ever happens as a result of argument. Perhaps sometimes it does, but this is surely the exception. 
Such, conver such conversions are typically as much a surprise to the person herself as to her friends. The phrase, she has become a new person, you wouldn't recognize her, typically means she no longer sees the point or relevance or interest of the arguments which she once deployed on the other side of the question. Common sense, however, like Greek philosophy, thinks that conversion should come about by argument. Common sense hopes that these conversions will not be like suddenly falling in love with an utterly different sort of person, but rather like gradually coming to recognize the shape of one's own mind, a shape which is sort of taken to be there permanently in the background, uh, despite all these changes. The Socratic assumption that desirable conversions are a matter of self-discovery rather than self-transformation necessitates the Platonic doctrine that every human mind has, in broad outlines, the same shape, the shape given by memory of the Platonic forms. In later philosophers, this becomes the belief in reason, either as a faculty for penetrating through appearance to reality, or as a set of elementary truths which lie deep within each of us waiting for an argument to bring them to life. To believe in reason in either sense to believe, is to believe that there is not only such a thing as human nature, but that this nature is not a matter of what we share with the other animals, but something unique. This unique ingredient in human beings makes us knowers rather than simply users, and thus makes us capable of being converted by argument rather than bowled over by irrational forces. We anti-essentialists, of course, do not believe that there is such a faculty. Since nothing has an intrinsic nature, neither do human beings. But we're happy to admit that human beings are unique in a certain respect. They do stand in a set of relations to other objects which no other objects stand into anything. Or more exactly, we have to admit that normal, adult, properly socialized and trained human beings stand in a unique set of relations. These human beings are the ones that are able to use language, and so they're able to describe things. As far as we know, nothing else is able to describe things. Numbers and physical forces can be greater than each other, but they don't describe each other as greater. We so describe them. Plants and the other animals can interact, but their success in these interactions is not a matter of their finding increasingly more profitable redescriptions of each other, whereas our success is a matter of finding such redescriptions. Darwin made it hard for essentialists to think of the higher anthropoids as, sudden, as having suddenly acquired an extra added ingredient called reason or intelligence, rather than simply more of the sort of cunning which the lower anthropoids had already manifested. That's why, since Darwin, Essentialist philosophers have tended to talk less about mind and more about language. Words like sign, symbol, language, and discourse have become philosophical buzzwords in our century in the way in which reason, science, and mind were buzzwords in the previous century. The development of symbolizing abilities is indeed susceptible to an evolutionary account in terms of increased cunning. But essentialist philosophers have tended to forget that they substituted language for mind in order to accommodate Darwin, and have gone on to raise exactly the same problems about the former as their predecessors raised about the latter. As I, earlier in this, as I said earlier in this lecture, these problems arise from thinking of language as a third thing, intruding between subject and object, and forming a barrier to human knowledge about of how things are in themselves. To keep faith with Darwin, however, we should think of the word language not as naming a thing with an intrinsic nature of its own, but as a way of abbreviating the kinds of complicated interactions with the rest of the universe which are unique to the higher anthropoids. This, it seems to me, is what Brandom has done in his book. That is, you know, this is, so to speak, the first philosophy of language which keeps full faith with Darwin by, you know, trying to make the connection between low cunning and sophisticated inquiry intelligible. Maybe not the first, but you know, the most thorough. These interactions are marked by the use of complex noises and marks to facilitate group activities as tools for coordinating the activity of individuals. The new relations in which these anthropoids stand to other objects are signalized not simply by the use of the mark X to direct the attention of the rest of the group to the object A, 
but by the use of several different marks to direct attention to A, corresponding to the several different purposes which A may serve, roughly corresponding. In philosophical jargon, one can say that behavior becomes properly linguistic only when organisms start using a semantical meta-language and become capable of putting words in intentional context. More plainly, it only becomes properly linguistic when you can say things like, it's also called Y, but for your purposes you should describe it as X. Or, you have every reason to call it an X, but nonetheless it isn't an X. For only at that point do we need to use specifically linguistic notions like meaning, truth, reference, and description. Only now does it become not only useful, but almost indispensable to describe the anthropoids as meaning A by X or believing falsely that all A's are B's. Looking at language in this Darwinian way as providing tools for coping with objects rather than representations of objects and as providing different sets of tools for different purposes obviously makes it hard to be an essentialist. For it becomes hard to take seriously the idea that one description of A can be more objective or closer to the intrinsic nature of A than another. The relation of tools to what they manipulate is simply a matter of utility for human purpose, not of correspondence. A stomach pump is no closer to human nature than a stethoscope, and a voltage tester is no closer to the essence of an electrical appliance than a screwdriver. Unless one believes with Aristotle that there's a difference between knowing and using, that there's a purpose called knowing the truth distinct from all other purposes, one will not think of one description of A as more accurate than another, sans phrase, for accuracy, like utility, is a matter of adjusting the relation between an object and other objects, a matter of putting an object in a profitable context. It's not a matter of getting the object right in the Aristotelian sense of seeing it as it is, apart from its relations to other things. An evolutionary description of the development of linguistic ability gives essentialist thinking no foothold just as an Aristotelian account of human knowledge leaves no room for a Darwinian understanding of the growth of such knowledge. Alvin Plantinga, uh, by employing an Aristotelian account of knowledge, I'm sorry, this is a footnote I meant to erase but didn't. Um, the, foot, the, the footnote would have said, Alvin Plantinga has used an Aristotelian account of knowledge to show that Darwin's theory of evolution is wrong. That is, his argument is, since we know what knowledge is, we also know that no creature that came into existence as Darwin came into existence could have it. Specifically, Planiga argues, our knowledge of Darwin's theory is the sort of thing which no Darwinianly evolved creature could possibly have. I'll fill in the footnote someday. But once again, you should notice that it would be inconsistent with my own pan-relationalism to try to convince you that the Darwinian way of thinking of language, and by extension the Dewey and pragmatist way of thinking of truth, is the objectively true way. All I'm entitled to say is that it's a useful way, useful for certain particular purposes. All I can claim to have done in this lecture is to offer you a redescription of the relation between human beings and the rest of the universe. Like every other redescription, this one has to be judged on the basis of its utility for a purpose. So it seems appropriate to end this lecture by turning to the question, for what purpose does the anti-essentialist think that his description of knowledge and inquiry of human culture is a better tool than the Aristotelian essentialist description? My answer has already been suggested over and over in these lectures, but I'll do it again. Pragmatists think that there are two advantages to anti-essentialism. The first is that adopting it makes it impossible to formulate a lot of the traditional philosophical problems and harder to incite the sort of culture wars in which philosophers like to take, take part. The second is that adapt, adopting it makes it easier to come to terms with Darwin. I agree with Dewey that the function of philosophy is to mediate between old ways of speaking developed to accomplish earlier tasks with new ways of speaking developed in response to new demands. I quote once again a passage, my favorite passage in Dewey, which I've already quoted. When it is acknowledged that under disguise of dealing with ultimate reality, philosophy has been occupied with the precious values embedded in social traditions, 
that it has sprung from a clash of social ends and from a conflict of inherited institutions with incompatible contemporary tendencies, it will be seen that the task of future philosophy is to clarify men's ideas as to the social and moral strifes of their own day. The social and moral strife incited by the publication of Darwin's The Descent of Man has been largely forgotten. But it seems to me that philosophy has still not caught up with Darwin, still not faced up to the challenge he presents. There's still, I think, a lot of work to be done in reconciling the precious values embedded in our traditions with what Darwin had to say about our relation to the other animal. Dewey and Davidson seem to me the philosophers who have done most to help us accomplish this reconciliation. To see the work of these men in this light, it helps to compare what they've done with what human Kant did. The latter philosophers found the task of assimilating the new science of the 17th century, faced the task of assimilating the new science of the 17th century to the moral vocabulary which Europe had inherited from, among other sources, the Stoics and the Christians. Hume's solution to the problem consisted in assimilating human reason to that of animals and assimilating human morality to the kind of benevolent interest in fellow members of the species which animals also display. Hume was a proto-pragmatist in the sense that when he is finished with it, the distinction between knowing reality and coping with reality has become very fuzzy indeed. But notoriously, Hume's solution struck most readers, especially German readers, as a cure worse than the disease. They thought that human knowledge, and in particular claims to universal and necessary truth, had to be saved from Hume. Kant offered an alternative solution, one which Hegel considered still far too skeptical and defeatist, far too Humean and proto-pragmatic. But philosophers less ambitious than Hegel have been, for the most part, willing to settle for some form of Kant's solution. Kant saved the claim to unconditionality in the form of universality and necessity by distinguishing between the transcendental phenomenal world-creating scheme and the empirical and merely phenomenal content which fills up that scheme. He immunized our traditional moral vocabulary, and in particular our claim to be under unconditional moral obligations, by sheltering it behind the wall which separates the moral and noumenal from the phenomenal and empirical. By creating this system, he earned the whole-hearted thanks of people who, like the protagonist of Fichte's vocation of man, had been afraid that their self-image as moral agents could not survive corpuscularian mechanics. Kant thus helped, helped us hang on to the notion of something non-relational because unconditional. Universal and necessary a priori synthetic truths and unconditional moral commands were safe because the world of corpuscularian mechanics was not the real world. The real world was the world in which we, behind our own backs, so to speak, constituted the phenomenal world, the same world in which we were non-empirical, non-pragmatic moral agents. Kant thereby helped us hang on to the idea that there was a great big difference between us and the other animals. For them, poor phenomenal things that they are, everything is relative and pragmatic. But we have a noumenal and transcendental side, a side which escapes relationality, so we may hope to know the truth in a non-Baconian sense of know, a sense in which knowing is quite different from using. We may hope to do the right in a sense of right which is not reducible to the pursuit of pleasure or the gratification of benevolent instincts. Darwin, however, made it much harder to be a Kantian than it had previously been. Once people started experimenting with a picture of themselves as what Darwin's fervent admirer Nietzsche called clever animals, that this isn't really true. Nietzsche invariably speaks ill of Darwin, meanwhile taking over you know, everything Darwin said with both hands, but t typical Nietzschean ingratitude. Uh, what Nietzsche, Darwin's fervent borrower Nietzsche called clever animals. They found it very hard to think of themselves as having a transcendental or a noumenal side. Further, when Darwinian evolutionary theory was brought together with the suggestion mooted by Frege and Peirce and anticipated by Herder and Humboldt, that it is language rather than consciousness or mind which is the distinguishing feature of our species, Darwinian evolutionary theory made it possible to see a behavior previously interpreted as fulfillment of the desire to know the unconditionally true and do the unconditionally right as continuous with animal behavior. 
For the origin of language, unlike the origin of consciousness or of a faculty called reason, capable of grasping the intrinsic nature of things, is intelligible in naturalistic terms. We can give what Locke called a plain historical account of how animals came to talk. But we cannot give a plain historical account of how they started, of how they stopped coping with reality and began representing it much less of how they stopped being merely phenomenal beings and began to constitute the phenomenal world. We can, of course, stick with Kant and insist that Darwin, like Newton, is merely a story about phenomena and that transcendental stories have priority over empirical stories. But the hundred-odd years spent absorbing and improving on Darwin's empirical stories have, I suspect and hope, made us unable to take transcendental stories seriously. In the course of those years, we have gradually substituted making a better future, a utopian democratic society for ourselves, for the attempt to see ourselves from outside of time and history. Pan-relationalism is one expression of that shift, the willingness to see philosophy as helping us to change ourselves rather than know ourselves is another expression. Um. I always think that Kant uh, uh, makes representationalism into a straw man, and uh, I think he gets it from you. Um, I, I mean, the very idea of representation tends to collect uh, um, trailing nasty things and, and, and to be rejected by the two of you because it's collected these nasty trailing things that, um, that actually aren't any part of that very idea of representation. Uh, such as, um, uh, uh, I mean, for, for this context, essentially, uh, I mean, the, the, the way of thinking that you are um, setting time relationalism against, um, I mean, it seems to me there's a really cheap, quick, uh, easy way to uh, hold on to represent, representationalist sounding uh, language. And while absolutely taking the point of the, of the opposition to essentialism that you're putting in terms of, of traditionalism, um, I, I actually had a, a place in the text that I can point to, um, uh, page 28. Um, the end of that paragraph that overlapped on the previous page, um, where you talk about um, getting the author right in the Aristotelian sense, seeing it as it is apart from its relations to other things. And what seems to be happening a lot in, in, in this talk is that the, the very idea of seeing things as they are is being used by you as if it had to have that right with it, apart from its relations to other. And that's no good. So um, we can't make any sense of the idea Yeah, of yeah that's, that's exactly the way I'm arguing. We just drop the right. Um, uh, so be a, be a pan-relationalist about seeing things as they are. Um, you know, now it's innocent of, 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 uh, of, of, of this kind of terribleness. Um, taking it back to a, a, a point earlier, I mean, I was made very uneasy by your um, kind of confession from, from um, within a pan relationalist pragmatism uh, that, that you're, you're, you're depriving yourself of, of uh, the possibility of saying, of, of you know, projects of escaping human finiteness, uh, that they are fantasies, illusions, whatever. Um, but um, with this, you know, relationalist sense of seeing things as they are, uh, it seems to me we, you know, we can we can keep, we can hold on to, uh, um, uh, uh, perfectly consistently with, with uh, all of the substantive points that you make, uh, a right to say uh, anybody who thinks that we human beings can. Uh, transcend our uh, finiteness, the finiteness that we have. I mean, so it's kind of innocent essentialism. Uh, you know, look, we're just animals, we're in one place, we, we live only for a finite period. Um, uh, there's, I mean, there's a well known uh, um, uh, kind of pseudo aspiration that people fall into um, out, of, out of an empty hope of, of transcending that. 
Uh, and I want to say that's a fantasy, that's an illusion. It makes me very uncomfortable if you mm. say that we can't say that. Yeah, I'm but I think you can say that while being consistent with the um, anti-essentialism that's, that's uh, the main thrust of this. Yeah, I, I mean, there are two things here. I don't want to say it's a fantasy or an illusion. Uh, I want to say it's a form of human life I wish fewer people would adopt. Uh, as I might say, I wish there were more Unitarians and fewer Southern Baptists, so to speak. Uh, but um, the, I think the main point here is would the notion of representation still look good if you were a thoroughgoing anti-essentialist. The argument on pages 28 to 29, in effect, is uh, nobody would have thought the notion of representation was of any particular interest if they hadn't had the image of more, my, my representation is more accurate than yours. You see as through a glass darkly, I see face to face. Uh, I don't think you can keep the notion of more accurate representation if you're a pan-relationalist. And I can't see that the notion of representation without the notion of more accurate, more accurate representation is worth anything. 